Today's sermon title is Misguided Expectations. Have you ever had some expectations that maybe were misguided? You know, you were expecting something and it wasn't the way you thought. You know, maybe it was a movie or a TV show or a restaurant and somebody had really, you know, build up to you and you were like, oh, I can't wait to go see that movie or I can't wait to eat at that restaurant and then you watch that movie or you eat at that restaurant and it just wasn't up to your expectations. Man, what's all the hoopla about this? It wasn't that good. The food didn't taste that great, but yet everybody's flocking to go there. Well, I want to share a story with you that to illustrate that point. And this story is, a, is actually a true story. Most of the stories that I tell you are true. I do embellish sometimes, but this one's true. So there was a, a woman who had just finished shopping at Walmart. Now, be honest. Do any of you shop at Walmart ever? Raise your hand. Do any of you ever hit the Walmart marketplace? You're just tired of spending a lot of money at some of the other places, and you're like, I'm going to marketplace today. I'm going to Walmart today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend less money. Need to. Get gas over there sometimes? Yes. So you can identify this woman. She's an older woman. She's about five foot two. She has white hair, and she's grocery shopping. And she's at Walmart. And as she's coming out with her bags, she goes over to her car. And as she approaches her car, she notices that there are four men sitting in her car. She drops her grocery bag, reaches into her purse, and she pulls out her pistol. And she points it at the men and she says, if you don't get out of my car, I'm going to shoot. And she's like this. And the men immediately get out of the car and take off running. Well, after she gets herself together, she puts her groceries in the car. She gets in the car. She goes to put the key into the ignition. She can't get it in there. It won't fit. And she realizes, uh-oh, this is not my car. Can anybody relate to that in here? You know it's true. You can relate to it. I told this story to my mother-in-law and the residents over at the Mansions Independent. And I wonder sometimes if they're listening or they can hear. They about died laughing when I told them because every one of them could identify with that. Well, she said, I've got to do the right thing. So she drove. Well, let me pack up. She got out of her car, and a few spaces down was her car, identical to the one she mistakenly thought was her car. She got into her car, and she drove down to the police station. And she got to the sergeant's desk, and she said, I've got to admit something. She said, it's terrible. She said, there were these men in what I thought was my car, and I pulled my gun on them, and I, I threatened to shoot at them, and they got out. And I realized... It wasn't my car, and I'm coming to confess. And the sergeant, he just started laughing. And she couldn't understand it. He said, you see those four men over there at the detective desk? They just came in and reported that a little lady, about five foot two, with white hair, pointed a gun at them and made them get out of the car. Now, I know that's funny. That story, now, she wasn't charged. She wasn't charged, and the men didn't file a charge against her. So that's a good thing. But that story was featured that evening on the local news. And immediately, that woman became a celebrity. Wrong or right, she became a celebrity. And when people would see her, they they thought it was actually pretty cool. Look at this little lady with her gun. You know, she was ready. Well, I share that story with you this morning because... For most of Jesus' ministry, I would say all of it, he did all he could to discourage his disciples from publicizing his work. He didn't want the attention drawn to him, no matter what the circumstance was. He was such a humble servant of God. He just didn't want those accolades. He didn't want to be gloated upon. The last thing that Jesus needed was a marketing genius to hype up his ministry. But isn't it interesting how we hype up ministry, don't we? I mean, the church does it. We see the billboards and the signs and the posters and the videos. We do it here. We do it everywhere. But we want to get as many people as we can who don't know Jesus into the house of the Lord so that they can experience Jesus, but not just experience him because, you know, we can all be experienced, right? Our desire is for folks to have an encounter with Jesus and his Holy Spirit so that they don't just change, because we know change is so temporary, but that they become transformed 
more like Christ. And that's his whole series, becoming more like Jesus. And that is a goal that we have. One of our top goals is to become more like him. So he became popular whether he really wanted to or not. Because when you are a person who can heal the sick, raise the dead, feed 5,000, it's difficult to keep the word from getting out. And so we've got this dramatic text that Sherry did such a beautiful job reading this morning from Mark 11. Jesus and his disciples are drawing near to the holy city of Jerusalem. And so they come to the villages of Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Now, realize that these are, are two cities that are on the outskirts of the city walls. So they haven't entered into the city of David yet. They're on the outskirts. And there's villages and cities all around the outside of the city. And we, we witnessed that when we went on our, our trip to the Holy Land. And the reason I want to tell you that is I want to paint a picture for you. Have you ever heard of the word outskirts? Oh, yeah, we live over on the outskirts of Atlanta, or the outskirts of Sandy Springs, or the outs, you know, skirts of Brookhaven, or whatever. So that, that word actually, actually is a biblical word. It's the people who were outside the city gates. We would probably refer to them maybe as the least of these, the people who didn't have nobility or have the money to live in the city. You know, as a single person here in Atlanta, I just found this out from attending the Family Promise uh, dinner the other night. As a single person in Atlanta, a single person now, to survive and just survive, you need to earn about $107,000 a year to survive in the city of Atlanta for a single person. You think people earn that much money? A lot of people do not earn that much money. So you see why it's so hard to live in a city or in this area? But people want to be here. People love being in the city. Well, the people on the outskirts, they would have liked to live inside the city of David in Jerusalem. They would like to have been there, but they didn't have the means. Except a couple of times a year when there was a great festival and there was getting ready to be a festival, the Passover, they could enter in. Those who lived on the outskirts and those who lived far away could make that Mecca, could make that journey and enter in. The gates would be open. And how exciting that is, folks. So here we have Jesus in Mark 11, his disciples, and they come to this village the two villages outside the city walls at the Mount of Olives. So Jesus sent two of his, of his disciples into the village, and he says, I want you to find a colt. There will be one colt that's never been ridden, and it will be tied up. And I want you to untie it. And he said, I want you to bring it here. Bring it back to me. If any, anybody asks you what you're doing, you say, the Lord needs it, and we will bring it back here shortly. <laughs> Can you imagine saying that? Somebody asks you, what are you doing untying that coat? Well, the Lord needs it, and we'll bring it back. The two disciples did what Jesus instructed them to do. They went into the village and found a coat outside the street, tied, it at, tied up at the doorway, just as Jesus said, and they untied it. And some people standing there, they asked, what are you doing untying that coat? You know, they answered as Jesus had told them. And the people let them continue with their assignment. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. He was ready to ride into the city, not in triumph, but in great humility. And then says Mark, something extraordinary happened. Many people along the way spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest! It was a scene of great joy and wondrous anticipation. However, it was based on misguided expectation. When the people along the way saw Jesus riding on a colt, approaching Jerusalem, they immediately thought Jesus would enter the city to smash, shatter, and break up the established order. They thought it would be a showdown between Jesus and the Roman officials. This was what they wanted. This is what they were hoping for. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It rang out everywhere. Marty reminded us that Hosanna is an interesting word. It's not a word you're likely to hear any other day of the year except Palm Sunday. 
There's a pastor, his name's Stephen Spencer, says that years ago when his youngest son was about three years of age, the boy was frustrated and angry as they left church. His face was all scrunched up, his cheeks puffing with breaths of displeasure. When they finally made it to the narthex, the back of the church, Stephen asked him, Philip, what's wrong? Philip replied, I thought we don't sing about Santa Claus in the church. What do you mean, son? We don't sing about Santa Claus in the church. His father asked him, to which Philip responded, Then why don't we just sing, Ho Santa, Ho Santa, Ho Santa in the highest. <laughs> you know, we can appreciate Philip's confusion. Hosanna's not a word we find in our daisy, day, daily, daisy, daily lexicon. It's just not. And yet, it's a word that we associate with the church. It can be translated, save us now. Save us now, not tomorrow, not next week, but right now. The people were asking Jesus to throw off their Roman oppressors and restore the throne, the throne of David as the legitimate rule over Israel and to do it the right way. The palm branches also had a specific symbolic meaning. 200 years earlier, Simon Maccabeus had defeated foreign armies and kept Israel independent. When he rode into Jerusalem, the people shouted cheers and waved palm branches because he was looked upon as a deliverer. If Jesus indeed was the Messiah, the people expected no less from him. And so the people were bubbling up with enthusiasm, but sometimes enthusiasm can be misguided. There's a story about a little boy whose family had moved from the farm into the city. The little boy got up one morning so filled with excitement that his mother, who wanted to sleep in, dressed him in play clothes and told him to play in the yard and quit bothering her. About 20 minutes later, he came running back. Mommy, mommy, he exclaimed. Everybody in the neighborhood has doorbells, and they all work. <laughs> that was some introduction for his family to their new neighbors. You know, excitement can be misguided, can it? I mean, if you're watching March Madness and you've got a team in March Madness and you've got these expectations because your team, you know, is so good and won the conference and beat all these big teams, some of you have been very humbled, haven't you? Your expectations went out the window. How in the world did we lose to that team, you know? It's the way it goes, right? It's March Madness. There are a lot of things in life that are like that. And it's interesting that Jesus chose a donkey for his grand entrance into Jerusalem. As somebody has pointed out, a donkey is a creature that never got any respect until Eddie Murphy played a donkey in Shrek. You saw that movie. We must admit most of us did see it. Jesus was riding a colt of a donkey, a symbol of humility, not a horse. I mean, you know. When you ride by a pasture somewhere, maybe it's up in Cumming, Georgia, or Dawsonville, or wherever, and you might see, you know, a meadow with horses, and they're beautiful, but then you see that one little donkey by itself. You feel sorry for it, don't you? You start singing, I am so lonely, you know, just thinking about that little donkey. He's just isolated. He's, he's kind of all by himself. He's... He's humble. Kind of reminds us of Eeyore, you know? Just humble. They just want a little bit of attention. Just somebody to talk to them. That's really all it is. And that's how Jesus chose to make his triumphal entry. You see, Jesus approached Jerusalem in peace as a humble servant, not a mighty warrior king as the people had expected. I mean, they knew the prophecy. They knew the Torah. They knew... It was supposed to happen in a very humble way that he was bringing peace, not war and love. But yet, for whatever reason, they wanted a warrior figure, a mighty warrior. And we know that he's a mighty warrior, a warrior of peace. He's referred to as the prince of peace. You see, the people were so preoccupied with the notion of political and economic power that they were blind to what was taking place before them. 
Does that sound familiar? Really. Not a lot has changed, has it? God was at work, but not in a way that they could comprehend. That's a reminder. God is still at work even when we can't see him. Do you agree with that? Yes. Amen. Yes, I do, folks. There's a great author. His name is Brian Waldrop. In his book titled Ocean Breeze, Inspirational Moments with God at the Beach, he tells of flipping through the channels of his TV one morning when he stopped to watch a painter skillfully painting a desert landscape. As the man proceeded to color the canvas in deep browns and reds and yellows, the picture really started to look good. He felt that the painter ought to stop. He was like, man, that looks great. You ought to stop. He's telling the TV, you need to stop. The picture looked complete. Then, as he was thinking those very words, he cringed to see that the artist added a dark blackish color of paint to the canvas. As Waldrop had feared, the dark blob looked awkward and out of place. But as the man continued to add textures and other colors to the blob, it began to take shape. When the painter was finished, the part of the picture that Brian Waldrop thought was ruined looked great. It was exactly what the painting needed to make it beautiful and complete. Waldrop writes, As I sat there watching the program that day, I was really surprised to find myself cringing at the many of the moves the artist made with his brush. I got to thinking how typical this is of my Christian life. Many times in my own life, after much struggle and hardship, I have come to a place where I'm, I'm comfortable. As I'm basking in the goodness of the Lord, God has chosen to institute a change I neither expected or wanted. During this time, I cry out, No, Lord, you're ruining the picture. But often, as I allowed God to continue his work on the canvas of my life, to my surprise, the picture would begin to look pretty good. Finally, I would thank him for the addition or subtraction to my life. Then he adds these profound words. There have been times, however, that the change never looked good to me and perhaps never will. During these times, I must remember that God is still painting. The picture has not been completed yet. I must travel on in faith, knowing that when I see him face to face, my painting will be beautiful. In the meantime, I can take comfort knowing that every situation, though it may be ugly and bad, is the paint that the master craftsman can use for good. God is at work even when we're not aware of it. The people that first Palm Sunday were looking for a conquering king. Jesus appreciated the people's high hopes, but he knew that those hopes were short-sighted. God had a different plan, a plan that would change the world forever. This brings us to the final thing that needs to be said this morning. It's our job to make God visible to the world. People are not likely to see God unless they see him in us. Christian author Philip Yancey in his book, Prayer, it's a beautiful book, by the way. If you want that book, Prayer by Philip Yancey, tells about a friend of his, an attractive young woman of mixed race named Joanna, who goes each day to visit the most violent prison in South Africa. Her efforts there have shown remarkable results in calming the violence, says Yancey, twice prompting the BBC to produce a documentary on her. In trying to explain those results, Joanna said to Yancey, Well, of course, Philip. God was already present in the prison. I just had to make him visible. What the people who welcomed Jesus in Jerusalem that day did not realize was that God was offering them an opportunity to join him in doing a new thing. Rather than simply smashing the oppressive government of that day, God was beginning at the bottom up to build a new world order. He was starting with a small group of men and women that would grow 
person by person through the ages until it transcended all the governments of this world. That ragtag army now numbers in the millions and is still growing. It's building hospitals and university and schools. It's healing the wounded and setting at liberty the captives. It's bringing people from darkness into light. That is, of course, the church of Jesus Christ. That's why we lift up our anthems of praise on this day. That is why we're shouting, Hosanna! Christ is alive, and He is still leading His church until that day comes when oppression is no more, and everyone lives in dignity and peace and freedom together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. May I ask you a question? Can he count on you? Because he's here. He's already conquered the grave, defeated evil and death. However, he's left you with a responsibility. You are the ones to make him known because he's here. You are to point people into that direction of Christ. To tell your story I believe most of us, if not all of us, have a rescue story that we can tell. How the Lord has blessed our souls, how he's healed us and delivered us. Now is the time to tell that story. Now is the time to invite others to be here. Doug reminded us not long ago that most people who don't attend church, the reason is they haven't been invited why is that? Can I ask you an even more personal question? When's the last time you invited somebody to Misty Creek? This is the week to do that, folks. You know you've got neighbors that you don't know, co-workers, even family. Maybe there are people in your household that you don't even invite. That would be sad, but it could be true. Be bold and strong and be a witness for Jesus Christ this week. He's here. You invite. You do the possible. And you trust him to do the impossible. Let's pray. Lord, as we are reminded that you entered in to the holy city this very day. For what would be your passion week, holy week. It would start with jubilation. And Lord, it would end with a cry from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it didn't end with that cry. When Jesus uttered the words, it is finished. Your work had been accomplished through Jesus, the salvation of the entire world. So as we go through this week, may we identify with all that Jesus went through all that he endured, knowing full well that he was born to die. But he also knew that he would resurrect and he would be the king of kings and that he would save us. Hosanna! He would save us and redeem us and bring us closer to you. For that we give thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen.